Moving into the late 60s, early 70s, I would be remiss if I skipped Thomas Pynchon's LA novel, Inherent Vice. Like his other California novel, Vineland, they stand in the shadow of those overwhelming texts like, of course, Gravity's Rainbow and Against the Day and even Mason and Dixon. But they're good novels on their own. It's just hard to take them outside of the context of Pinchon's overall repertoire. Inherent Vice takes the noir genre, which actually has a lot of ties into Los Angeles, as I've been learning, especially from Mike Davis's book about Los Angeles. It's called The City of Quartz. I highly recommend it. It goes all through how the noir changed and transmuted and has direct ties into the development of the popular consciousness depiction of Los Angeles. But of course, in true Pinchon fashion, he takes the noir and he makes a parody of it. Um, you know, we have the private investigator who uh, is sort of this third party in this triangular tension of law enforcement and justice and investigation between the FBI, the LAPD, and then the outside party, which in this case would be Doc Larry Sportello, who spends as much time trying to work on behalf of his clients as he does getting high. Yes, this is the 60s. We've got all kinds of 60s era Americana in here. Pinchon, in his usual fashion again, uh, is set on creating a miniature encyclopedia or perhaps trivia dictionary for the 60s culture in America. And we've got, you know, the, the Manson murders and everything around that haunts the text and haunts the people out there. They aren't as apt to uh, pick up hippies who are hitchhiking. And in fact, there is, of course, with the war riots and uh, we're coming out of the race wars in Watts, just not too much further back in the past, which is re referenced in here and which Pinchon wrote uh, a nonfiction essay, essay about as well. There's this change in the atmosphere in Los Angeles um, that's directly linked to the Charles Manson murders and, and everything that we found out subsequently during the trial. The whole novel kicks off with Doc Sportello sitting back and you can almost hear this voiceover say something like, Doc Sportello was kicked back in his office when she walked in, the dame in distress. She was an old fling of Doc's, but it had been a while, you know, and so on. And it turns out that she is an old flame of Doc Sportello's and she has come to him to ask for some help because she's gotten herself in over her head with this mogul, this billionaire mogul whose name is Mickey Wolfman and he's got all these housing developments. And by the way, real estate uh, is a major part of the history of Los Angeles. Also, uh, Mike Davis talks about it in his book and it's captured here by Pinchon as well. Wolfman is this mogul who has taken Shasta, which is the name of Sportello's old flame. He's taken Shasta as his mistress. But now, you know, his wife Sloane also has whatever is the opposite of a mistress. She has a boy toy, apparently is also her spiritual advisor. There's all kinds of, of hippie stuff and new world, new age stuff and uh, Eastern mysticism. But aside from just being a parody, Pinchon gets a lot of mileage, a lot of use out of transferring the typical alcoholism of that, that rough and gruff PI, that mysterious figure who kind of comes in and in the end, despite all odds and despite his obvious personal ailments, you know, saves the day. He switches that alcoholism over to uh, a penchant for smoking weed. And so Doc Sportello is constantly trying to, you know, carry out these investigations and go from one lead to another and make these deductions in a, in a haze of marijuana smoke. At the end of many of these chapters, Pinchon proves himself as the master of the punchline. Pinchon's punchlines. They should be collected in some kind of anthology. We get his signature banana trope. This time, however, it's not pirate Prentice's 
pancake breakfasts. It's instead the detective in the LAPD called Bigfoot and the deal that he has made to keep himself supplied with frozen bananas, actually chocolate covered frozen bananas. So yeah, have fun with that one. There are all these great one-liners besides just the punchlines that bring a chapter to a close, such as PIs should really stay away from drugs. All them um, alternate universes just make the job that much more complicated. We have references to all of the antecedent figures in this kind of fiction. They're not parodying it. They're pioneering it. Philip Marlowe and Sam Spade and so on. Um, but besides literary culture, which is actually pretty minimal in this book, what is at the fore is pop culture, especially TV and movies and music. This book is packed with more references to real and fictional uh, song lyrics and character lines and actors and actresses and TV series. Everything is seen through that lens, if you will. And of course it is. This is not only something that Pinchon was playing with even in Gravity's Rainbow, which is so structured off of the concept of film, uh, but it's an L.A. novel. Pinchon spent time at living in Manhattan Beach, and you can tell he really soaked in everything around him. To capture that atmosphere of L.A., he writes such things as exhaust from millions of motor vehicles mixing with microfine Mojave sand to refract the light toward the bloody end of the spectrum. Everything dim, lurid, and biblical. Sailor, take warning, skies. It sounded like a rainstorm, the wind raging in the concrete geometry, the palms beating together like the rush of a tropical downpour, enough to get you to open the door and look outside, and of course, there'd only be the same hot, cloudless depth of day, no rain in sight. So, on the one hand, beautifully written prose. I hope you could hear that musical quality to it uh, and the clever word choice, but also hearkening back to that fact of how little rain L.A. really gets. As Doc approached downtown L.A., the smog grew thicker till he couldn't see the end of the block. Everybody had their headlights on, and he recalled that somewhere behind him, back at the beach, it was still another classic day of California sunshine. The place is so sprawling and so dynamic. It's in the middle of the desert, but it's also at the end of the western United States, right there at the coast. It's rocky, it's sunny. The water, when I was there in August at Newport Beach and Long Beach, the water was freezing. And then, you know, the, it can get super cloudy and foggy, and you're in the middle of a vast metropolis down, you know, downtown LA. It's just this sprawling, dynamic place. One thing I loved is that Pinchon talks about how one character walking around in Santa Monica is walking around in this constant haze of marijuana because people are lighting up everywhere. And he's trying to capture, you know, that hippie uh, drug culture of the, of the late 60s. But what's so funny is here, I just went there uh, at the end of August in 2021, and I literally walked out of Book Monster in Santa Monica. And as I walked from there to the parking deck to, to go back to my car, there were people lighting up marijuana everywhere. And I was smelling it every few steps. It was exactly like the late 60s. Not that I remember it. And not that I was there and did drugs and forgot it. But obviously, I wasn't born then. So it's funny to see how the 60s in California are not so far off again here in the 2020s. Another great dimension to Inherent Vice is that Pinchon gives us the onset and rise of what would become the internet, starting with its earlier phase as ARPANET, which was a government the Department of Defense, it became DARPANET, a uh, way of connecting computers around the world. This is a very novel thing at the time, as you know, we learn through Doc Sportello's eyes. And there are two proto-hackers. One is named Fritz and the other is named Sparky. And this is at the very end of the book. It's not the very last thing that happens, but it's just a few pages off. And uh, Doc has come in to try to have Fritz uh, get some information for him because he knows that Fritz is obsessed with the uh, ARPANET and he hangs out on his computer all the time and can get information. But instead, Sparky's there. And we get this little exchange. Sparky shrugged. 
it's harder for me to work if I'm on drugs. Of course, Sportello has just offered him uh, some weed and he declines. Or maybe I'm just one of those people who shouldn't be going in for drugs. Doc says, Fritz said after he'd been on the network for a while, it felt like doing psychedelics. He also thinks ARPANET has taken his soul. Doc thought about this. Has it? Sparky frowned off into the distance, and then he starts talking. The system has no use for souls. Not how it works at all. Even this thing about going into other people's lives... It isn't like some Eastern trip of absorbing into a collective consciousness. It's only finding stuff out that somebody else didn't think you were going to. And it's moving so fast. Like the more we know, the more we know. You can almost see it change one day to the next. Why I try to work late. Not so much of a shock the next morning. Wow, I guess I better learn something about this or I'll be obsolete. And then back to Sparky. It's all pretty clunky waving around the room at the equipment there. Down here in real life, compared to what you see in spy movies and TV, we're still nowhere near that speed or capacity. Even the infrared and night vision they're using in Vietnam is still a long way from x-ray specs, but it all moves exponentially. And someday everybody's gonna wake up and find they're under surveillance they can't escape. Skips won't be able to skip no more. Maybe by then, there will be no place to skip to. And so this is getting at that Pinchonian paranoia into uh, what Foucault calls the panopticon and just under constant surveillance and interconnectivity uh, and the fact that you can't go anywhere uh, without being observed. The coffee machine burst into a loud synthesized vocal of Valare. Fritz programmed that in. I might have gone more for Java Jive. Little before your time. Doc says. And then listen to this. It's all data, ones and zeros, all recoverable, eternally present, to which Doc says, groovy. We get this sense that time is now moving on from the late 60s. ARPANET, computers, networks. Time is moving on past what Sportello understands. And furthermore, it's about to hit the gas pedal and Moore's law is going to kick in and it's going to move exponentially fast. We also, in that passage, perhaps get a glimpse of what would become Pinchon's book, The Bleeding Edge. I want to end this short little segment on inherent vice by just reading one paragraph that, again, gives us that Pinchonian, elaborate set piece and bonkers mishaps. And this reminded me a little bit of In Gravity's Rainbow when Teddy Bloat fell and Pirate Prentice kicked his sleeping cot to catch him uh, at the end of his fall. Back at his place, Doc found Scott and Dennis, not Dennis, Dennis, in the kitchen investigating the icebox. Having just climbed in the alley window after Dennis, a bit earlier down at his own place, had fallen asleep as he often did with a lit joint in his mouth. Only this time, the joint, instead of dropping onto his chest and burning him and waking him up at least partway, had rolled someplace else among the bedsheets, where soon it began to smolder. After a while, Dennis woke, got up, and wandered into the bathroom. Thought he would take a shower. Sort of got into doing that. At some point, the bed burst into flame, burning eventually up through the ceiling, directly above which was his neighbor, Chico's Chico's waterbed. Luckily for Chico, without him on it, which being plastic melted from the heat, releasing nearly a ton of water through the hole that had by now burned into the ceiling, putting out the fire in Dennis's bedroom while turning the floor into a sort of wading pool. Dennis came drifting back from the bathroom and not able right away to account for what he found, plus getting the fire department, who had now arrived, confused with the police, went running down the alley to Scott Oof's beach place, where he tried to describe what he thought had happened. Basically, deliberate sabotage by the boards, who had never stopped plotting against him. So again, just steeped in the atmosphere and culture of the time in which it is set, and full of blunders and capers and hijinks, it's Thomas Pinchon with an L.A. novel.